I remember years ago, Meredith, I'll, I'll set the show up this way, and I, Ben, I'm sure you can hear me, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know when Ben first did these tests on himself. It was, you know, proving that, you know, fat-adapted athletes exist, right, meaning that, you know, the, the old days of all the high carbs, you know, with athletes, you know, I believed were gone, right, but yet they were still saying we didn't have a lot of proof, and, and Ben in his own studied uh, at one of the, a university, and he can tell us which one, actually did a study on himself, and Ben literally got on a treadmill for three hours, did all this blood work and biopsies and uh, urine samples, stool samples, everything before the study, got on the treadmill for three hours, re-ran all the blood work and the urine and the stool and everything, and uh, we'll have him talk about those results, but that inspired me to actually when I read it, I said, you know, I'm fat adapted because I had been in ketosis. So I said, I'm going to fast overnight like I usually do, intermittent fast. And it was around 18 hours. And I went on a three-hour fast bike ride, fasting 18 hours. So 18, 19, 20, 21. By the time I got home, 22 or 23 hours before I'd eaten one bite of food, didn't bonk. Everyone on the ride, which are great athletes, were eating. And I was the only one not eating. And uh, to their surprise, I never balked. I had plenty of energy with over 20 hours uh, without food. And Ben proved that in the laboratory. wonder if we can hear him now and he can talk about some of these results as proving fat-adapted athletes do exist. Talk about what inspired you to do that study on yourself and then talk about what occurred during the study, what you measured, and of course, you know, how that affected uh, life afterwards. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, for anybody who uh, likes to don their propeller hat and dive in, that study is available as a full PDF if you really want to dig into the methodology um, and the, the excellent discussion that is in that particular study. The FASTER study is what it was called. Um, my um, reasons for doing it were, frankly, pretty selfish, right? I'm racing Ironman triathlon, and... I wanted to go faster or at least be able to maintain the speed that I was used to going at for longer periods of time. And I wanted to do so without experiencing a lot of the potentially deleterious effects that chronically elevated blood sugar can cause or the potentially unsettling effects that carbohydrates fermenting in your gut can cause. And so... Um, because of that, and also because of the fact that in my genetic testing, I've been shown to have about a 17% higher than normal risk for type 2 diabetes. Yeah, it's very important to figure out a way to actually uh, uh, hack Ironman triathlon, so to speak, without going the traditional route of fueling with, with gels and bars and, and energy drinks and things of that nature. So um, over the course of the year that I was preparing for that study, meaning following the special diet of about 80 to 90 percent fat, uh, 5 to 10 percent carbohydrate, uh, protein would vary a little bit depending on the day's activities, right, on a, very, on a day that involved a lot of eccentric muscle tearing type of activity, particularly weight training or running, you know, I would get protein up to close around 20%. Uh, most of the rest of the time, protein wasn't that high either. Protein was around 10 to 20%. So really a great deal of my, of my dietary intake came from fat. So I was not allowed near any Italian restaurants mm -hmm. at all. Um, anyways, though, so uh, I raced twice in terms of Ironman races during the course of that year. I raced Ironman Canada, and I raced Ironman Hawaii, and it was really interesting to experience long, stable sources of energy, even in the absence of a high amount of exogenous carbohydrate intake. Um, and, and we're not talking about a complete absence of carbohydrates, because frankly, um, you know, the nature of the beast of something like, say, an Ironman triathlon is you're out there for, for nine hours or ten hours, but there are, there's a lot of what is, what is called burning the match, 
during that period of time. Right. What that means is that when you pass someone during the race on the bike ride, you might be going from your normal race pace of 250 watts up to like 400 watts. And so that actually does cause a, a, a pretty significant glycolytic shift, you know, a, a response of your body needing to burn through a high amount of carbohydrates. So it's not like you're going for a long endurance event if you're doing ketosis with zero carbohydrates. But it's a much, much slower body. About a quarter of the amount of carbohydrates I would normally consume you know, during the actual event, along with ample amounts of easy-to-digest proteins, uh, particularly amino acids, and then also easy-to-digest fats, particularly medium-chain triglycerides. And since that time, I've added in a third energy component, and that would be ketones, literally yeah, exogenous yeah. ketones in a powder form that you can take to, to jack up your ketone levels. Um, yeah, we, uh, so we, interviewed, we interviewed Dr. Don Mark Jagger, 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 and uh, he uh, talked a lot about endogenous ketones. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, um, what did you just say? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. Echo there. Um, we interviewed Dominic D'Agostino about some of the exogenous ketones, and we've uh, added those to your fat regime. Yeah, I wish I'd known about those when I was racing Ironman. I've been using them since, but during the time that I was preparing for this particular study that we were talking about, that, that wasn't something that was really readily yeah. available. So... Um, anyways, though, that, that particular year of racing culminated in the study that you were referencing where we went in and we did uh, a lot, a lot of, of tests, but some of the more notable tests that we did uh, was a, uh, a microbiome to see how the gut differs between someone who follows a high-carbohydrate diet and someone who follows a high-fat diet. We did uh, fat biopsies to see if the actual fat tissue makeup was any different. We did muscle biopsies before and after exercise to see if there was any difference in the ability of the muscle to be able to store carbohydrates or how quickly the muscle burnt through carbohydrates. We did a resting metabolic test, which is just a test of how much carbohydrate and how much fat you're burning at rest, yeah. along with an exercise metabolic test, which is a measurement of how much carbohydrate, how much fat, and how many calories you're burning during exercise. Long story short is that, and, and I'm sure that, that you know this based on your conversation with Dr. Volek, uh, you know, even though most physiology textbooks will inform us that we can burn about 1.0 grams of fat per minute, during exercise, um, the athletes who followed a ketotic or a low carbohydrate diet for close to 12 months were experiencing fat oxidation values of closer to 1.5 to 1.8 grams of fat per minute, significantly higher than, uh, than what you would expect. And so there's, there's not only a, a glycogen sparing effect in a scenario like that, but there's also some pretty significant health implications, meaning that you're you're creating fewer free radicals and experiencing mm -hmm. less fermentation in the gut and experiencing less fluctuations in blood sugar. Um, and I, I guess one of the one of the more annoying parts for me about the whole results of that test was that you know people said, oh, they call it the faster study, but you guys weren't going any faster. You guys who did the you did the high fat diet. Well, that's not the idea. That That is where I think people get right. derailed a little bit. The goal here is not to go faster. The goal here is to go as fast, right, yeah. To yeah. to figure out a way to limit the health effects or eliminate the health effects of chronic fluctuations in blood sugar or chronically elevated blood sugar while still maintaining similar speeds. And so that, that was my whole philosophy going into this was if I can go just as fast by limiting sugars, why not do it? If I slow down, well then I have to I have to ask myself that question of where what kind of balance do I want between health and performance? How many years of my life or how many years of my joints or how much gut distress am I willing to sacrifice in exchange for going just a little bit faster? Now fortunately, it turns out that you can go just as fast, again, not faster, but just as fast on a on a carbohydrate-limited diet, so why not do it? 